Okay. Uh, can everyone hear me? I will try to sort of like juggle a few things and speak into the microphone. Um, so I guess uh, thank you, Cosmin, uh, uh, for having me uh, participate in this conference. Um, and this is a work in progress, and I do hope to sort of like get some uh, feedback from the audience today. So sometimes creating an artwork takes you to strange places, places I would never for the life of me imagine I would have any, any affinity towards. One particular morning, 3 a.m. morning, during a time when I have spent weeks building up a visual vocabulary of Aceh, a state that until then was only known to me to be a west, in the western province of Indonesia on the northern tip of Sumatra, uh, that have gained some measure of autonomy to brand itself as an Islamic fundamentalist theocracy of some repute. Uh, that, uh, and after foolishly agreeing to participate in Cosmin's last show, an opera for animals, where he ins his instruction was simply to find me the tiger dancers and the 18th century Malay songs you've been posting about on your Instagram and make me two artworks. <laughs> I managed to negotiate down to one. And at 3 a.m. in the morning, I came across a set of watercolor paintings on the Dutch online repository, uh, World Kulturen. The paintings come in a set of 14, and they were recorded to have entered the Volkerkun Museum collection before 1907, all measuring 34 by 42 cm. If I were to affect the anthropologist or the art historian of yore, I would describe the style as naive and cartoon-like. But the Walker art historian and anthropologist in me was drawn to a number of badass gender-bending buraks that were cramping their style and occupying center stage. Here are some of them. And uh, then you can see that there's a comic act unfolding around the buraks, right? Uh, check out the bearded dude who's wearing a bling. And next to him, there was a man fighting with a black jaguar. And on the, the painting above him, there are people being chased around. And a couple was looking as uh, in the next painting, the pup, a couple looks as if there's, you know, they just, just returned from shopping. Uh, and then uh, in, the, in the one below that, uh, you see uh, uh, a guy being beaten up by, uh, as a giant chicken looked on. So using Google Translator, I managed to learn that they were attributed to the hands of someone called Tengku Tengo. Naturally, my curiosity was piqued. Uh, here is a named artist. And then the morning call for prayers were bled out in the neighborhood mosque. I wasted another night on a stupid art project. But I found something else. <laughs> right? At the dawn of the 20th century, even the Burak, the mythical creature, winged equid, that was assigned with the task of transporting the Prophet Muhammad to and from the heavenly realms was keeping time. Clock-wearing buraks figured significantly in at least three out of the 14 paintings produced by a local Archinese chieftain in a country that has just lost its sovereignty to Dutch Imperium after engaging in a three-decade-long armed conflict. The burak is a legendary flying tree. Uh, flying steed that served the Prophet Muhammad and the prophets before him. Typically, the animal is connected to two sequential tales about the Prophet Muhammad's night journey, known as the Isra and the Miraj. In the former tale, Muhammad was conveyed on this flying horse from Mecca to Jerusalem, while, his the, while the latter account describes the continuation of his heavenly, uh, heavenward journey toward God, followed by a survey of paradise and hell uh, before returning back to Jerusalem and then to Mecca. The entire journey took place over the course of one single night. While early accounts describe the burak as a white animal that is smaller than a mule and larger than a donkey with a visage that is described as resembling that of the descendants of Adam, uh, the proliferation of the Book of Ascension and the Persian Mirage poem in the 13th century supplied us with uh, the kind of rich iconography that we have today. This continues to shape popular imagination of the Burak from today uh, uh, until today. One could say the animal is typified as a four-legged steed uh, with uh, often different bodily sections described as having the semblance of body parts of other animals. Most significantly, uh, the burak is visualized as possessing a human head at this point. As a genre of literature that gained widespread popularity and subsequent authors uh, writing their own versions did not simply refer to antecedent texts. Each articulation was also constituted by interactions with their local religious cultures, resulting in the composite 
that is equally an exercise of imagination and improvisation. One could say the composite assemblage fulfills the hybrid form of the Burak in the form of a literary structure. This is also to suggest that each translation is a tubular outgrowth of a cipher that then produces a new type of amalgamation. Uh, Christian Gruber suggests that with the Book of Ascensions, uh, the Hadith, which is the accounts of the Prophet's deeds, is given a biographical dimension. And this biographical dimension is then transformed into a hortatory parable. Uh, what she really sort of, I guess, means is like pendant, uh, and, and she talks about this in relation to how pendant to the textual visualization of the Burak is the visual textualization of the Burak as well. And visual representations of the Buraks therefore circulated uh, in the Malay archipelago, uh, known in, in uh, it's a geographic expanse, uh, known to Arab traders then as the Zerbat, right, or the land below the winds. Prominent examples including the Okir sculptures from Mindanao that had a pride of place during Islamic feasting ceremonies. It also makes its appearance in Bugis diary from Sulawesi. There is also Javanese examples and in a ranting or branch story of, um, of, the, of, of the Malay Peninsula East Coast Wayang Shadow Play. And lastly, Within Aceh itself, it appears in decorative curtains used during rites of passage rituals such as circumcision of, of, of marriage. More significantly, the Burak's relationship with other winged creatures tends to sit within a spectrum. So what about this rooster-like chicken that we've been seeing just now, right? Uh, nested within the tail of the Isra and the Mirage is the encounter with the celestial rooster. So rather than think of syncretism or hybridity, can we frame the cosmology of the Indian Ocean as a composite time? In thinking of the Creole as a body of composites, icons consolidate assembly of stories through associative affinity. The composite also holds together multiple historicities and iconographies that point to its existence as a broad, broad, broad spectrum, right? Whether it is in the form of a coconut grater uh, in the, uh, that's you, uh, that, that, that actually signifies uh, uh, a sacred bird uh, known as the Sarimano amongst the Mar Maranaos of the Mindanaos, or the celestial blood, the Burung Patala or the Burung uh, Surogaga processional vehicles amongst the Patani and Kelantanese people, or in the finger ring of a peacock from Aceh, or maybe it's a turkey now, the place are connected to our study. In other instances, such as in the Cerebonis, uh, Kasipohan, and Kanoman courts, the composite is spelled out more distinctly. Here we have a version of the form of the greater Singabarong from the Kasipohan court, uh, in both sort of like its bate and its original sort of like processional vehicle. Attributes include wings taken from the Burak bird, symbolizing possibly its Islamic influence. The dragon, namely the creature with the body of the lion and the scales of the dragon, depicts a mythological connection to China, uh, especially, the bird, uh, uh, especially the creature called the Qilin. And then the lion body in turn references the lion and tiger, which are interchangeable quotes in Southeast Asia for the lion throne of Ali, which, has, uh, uh, which, which draws from um, Shiite sort of like uh, accounts of sort of uh, 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 Ali, who is the prophet sort of like uh, son-in-law. The elephant representing Ganesh, the god, uh, the god of who is the remover of obstacles in Hinduism, and the tree of life, which has its source in Austronesian, Malayo, Polynesian cosmology, which you see the uh, vehicle being crashed up against. Uh, and I think Tan Zi Hao, uh, who's speaking tomorrow, uh, will have to say more about this since his research actually focuses specifically on Cerebon. Um, the Burak finds its way into this Weltanschauung principally as a central character in the Tabut procession. As captured in this photo, uh, 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 show, uh, showing like a procession in a neighboring village of Aceh in Padang on the highlands lining the coast, west coast of Sumatra and more of the tabut will be sort of like discussed further. But why do they figure so significantly in Tengku Tengo's painting? What functions might they serve? Besides the set of painting, the closest illustration of the Burak in, in this manner is a curious drawing that is currently found in the Tropen Museum. The museum annotation points to its use as a wall decoration. 
and according to information from collector uh, Stein's house, the drawing is the color drawing is a color drawing made by a Nya Adam uh, Jut Mat in Kampong Lo Timon in Chalang in 1920. The draftsman is self-taught, and this is in the annotation, never been schooled, and the canvas is painted by an A.J. Payen, which I take to mean Antoine Payen the Younger, the Belgian naturalist who taught the 19th century Javanese painter Radin Saleh prior to the latter's travel to Europe. But this information actually does not compute when we consider that Payen died in 1853 and the first expedition that sparked the Aceh War did not really begin in 1873. So I'm still trying to figure out what the word actually painted here actually means. I wonder if it means prime or, or something else. So someone could possibly help me on that. But in, um, in a thesis written by Lauren, she suggests that Nya Adam Chutmat's Chalang illustration might suggest a possible function for Tengku Tengo's set of paintings, that these were wall decoration that possesses talismanic qualities and could be found in the manusa that would typically be attached to a ballet or the home of an aristocrat, and would function primarily as a kind of men's club or a frat house, right? Uh, <laughs> this ecology is depicted in uh, one of Tengku Tengo's painting, uh, and you, uh, uh, one of Tengku Tengo's painting, uh, and you see the huge sort of like home over there, that's his ballet, and the munasa, which is the tiny little structure that you see next to the house where men from the village would sort of gather and make important decisions pertaining to uh, uh, how, how they want to run the village. Uh, uh, and a paint, uh, and yeah, uh, so it's, it's give me sense that. And a pandan painting uh, will show you a sense of what a typical moss structure from uh, the land below the winds, which features a tiered roof construction. Its two tier roof structure suggests that it is a regional moss since multiple tier uh, tiers tend to suggest closer proximity to power. And uh, so very little uh, is actually uh, of, uh, we know very little about Tengku Tengo. So far my searches in the archives have turned up nothing. I did all my usual sort of like, uh, tricks and uh, searches, but you know, nothing sort of like came up. I think Tengo is probably a, a, a sort of like stand-in name. Uh, it just means middle or center. So he would be someone uh, maybe middle in the line, but we know it came to nothing. Uh, uh, but we know that it came into the Volker Kun collection through an Indo-Eurasian colonial military officer by the name of General Major Theodorus Jacobus Veltman. Uh, and these, and uh, let me show you here, okay, perfect. Uh, and in his annotation, he notes that Tengku Tengo is an acting ulibalang of Pate, a sub-district of Pulau Raja, coast of West Aceh, and that's all he provided, right? And I run it through all my searches and nothing sort of like came up. Uh, but we know that Beltman is born into a military family in Semarang, entered Royal Military Academy in 1885, and in 1896 was relocated to Aceh. And of course he was actively part of the Achenese uh, war and expedition, uh, posted with the 9, 14 and 12 battalions and was honored with numbers of uh, medals. His award from this period, including the 1896 Medal for Important Military Aceh in Action in Aceh. And he was then transferred to a particular sort of like guerrilla special task force. Uh, 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 that was set up in 1899. And Valman would go on to acquire a whole range of metal under this sort of like special task force, principally by demonstrating that he was able to annihilate an extensive number of enemy forces. Uh, by 1809, Feldman was made captain of the, this special task force, and in October the same year, his, uh, uh, his civil position was then transferred to Pulau Raya, where this painting was found and he remained there until 1905. So I think uh, this is the period where he sort of acquired the painting. Uh, uh, and, and because of his sort of like, you know, uh, commit his dedication and commitment to uh, the Dutch Imperium, he was given an annual leave. So in, uh, I think 1906 or 1907, he traveled back to uh, uh, the Netherlands, and in the summer of 1907, the exhibition of Veltman's war loot uh, was held at the Wright's Ethnographic Museum with the title, Exhibition of Ethnographic Objects from Aceh. 
It was one of the first three consecutive exhibitions connected to the Dutch colonial exploits. Part of Johannes uh, Dietrich uh, Schmelz, a museum director's attempt to publicize the collection and to stimulate interest in the East. Almost all of the approximately 750 objects from Aceh that Veltman sold to the museum were exhibited in 1907. The artifacts were classified into 12 categories according to an evolutionary scheme. This begins with the basic needs such as food and drinks before progressing to survey, te survey technological, to be before progressing to survey technological innovations from clothing to jewelry and weaponry. And finally, art and religion takes the 12th spot and represented the highest form of cultural and civilizational achievement of a particular culture. So on what terms can the Burak in this set of paintings be rendered legible, right? Executed in a style that has been described as folk or naive. And by an artist about whom we know very little about, the 14 paintings entered the Leiden's National Museum of Ethnology around 1907. By default, an ethnological lens has therefore thus far overdetermined or perhaps actually underdetermined the painting's subsequent reception or non-reception. The reinvention of a pictorial knowledge in this set of watercolor paintings, I think, deserves reassessment. More so because Tengku Tengo can be understood as an outlier artist who explored new pictorial possibilities with watercolor paint around the same time as European modernism began to take flight. Writing on Cubism and abstract art in uh, 1936, Alfred Barr defines, Alfred Barr Jr. defines a tendency of the modern with a claim. And I quote him here, the artists of the early 15th century, for instance, were moved by a passion for imitating nature. In the early 20th century, the dominant interest was almost exactly opposite. By a common and powerful impulse, they were driven to abandon the imitation of natural appearance. There is a rather interesting annotation in a pencil over the scanned copy of the catalog on, uh, that you can find on MoMA's website that cancel out the day in the last sentence and annotated it with the phrase, many of them above it. And this small little intervention suggests that perhaps for the reader who made the annotation, other priorities and theaters of the modern exist. What if we remove the ethnological lens and relocate the paintings of Tengku Tengo into a, a different kind of theater? not even that of whatever we call ASEAN or Southeast Asia, but that of the Indian Ocean. Right. In this instance, I suggest across the body of water lies an imagistic power of the composite. Right. Uh, and there is this aggregate of temporalities that brings into awareness other origin stories that can gain currency and urgency within modernist standard time. This is expressed uh, in the painting depicting a procession with an iconological density that I won't even have time to unpick, right? Uh, but, you know, just to sort of like draw connections, I want to quickly hint at the fact that th there are a lot of like men holding on to the sugar cane does sort of like, uh, you know, uh, remind me of uh, Ucho's talk yesterday about the sugar cane liquor that he was concocting amongst his friends yesterday. So, uh, Often, scholarly consensus suggests that this type of procession, in Southeast Asia, it's called a tabot um, uh, procession, but I think in, in India, it ref uh, it's called the tazia. And basically, they refer to principally that, that little, cons that little uh, uh, that encasement that it's sort of like carried and hoisted along by uh, the two men down there. Uh, and, uh, and it represents a tomb, the tomb of Hussein, who is the grandson of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, uh, and his martyrdom on the fields of Kabbalah, where he was fighting against the forces of Yazid. And, uh, and because of his death, uh, the Muharram celebration, which is what the Tabut commemorates, uh, is basically a celebration that commemorates his death and also um, uh, and commemorates the kind of injustice that was visited upon the Prophet's family. Yeah? And uh, typically, this kind of procession, uh, many scholars would suggest that it was introduced to Sumatra in the 18th century with the East India, uh, English East in British East India Company populating Bengkulu on, in West Sumatra with soldiers, convict laborers, and workers. And while serving as a British footing along the spice trade, it was not often regarded as a strategic port, right? And, and raffles then would 
principally use it as a penal colony prior to trading uh, prior to trading the city with the Dutch for Singapore later on in 1825. Raffles and Marsden, while they were there, did not actually mention the Tabut at all. And in fact, the earliest account of Tabut in Bengkulu pretty much came from Dutch observers from the 1860s to the 1880s. And Dutch writings then normally attribute the Tabut with a South Asian origin that was introduced to Bengkulu by the British East India Company. The rituals reinforced this perspective since most sacred places connected to the stages of the uh, Muharram celebrations are dedicated to a Saik bah Bahanuddin uh, who is known as an Indian sepoy. Uh, typically, existence of, uh, you know, sacred... So the, the, the kind of typology is typically with the... Uh, 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 there is a, it's connected to how uh, there's a sacred place in which the soil, soil of that place is uh, symbolically representative of Kabbalah, uh, which is the site where uh, uh, Hussein sort of like was martyred and, or, or killed. Uh, and then there are the building of all these colorful cenotaphs or tombstones, which would include, repre include representations of the mystic, mythical burats and flowers. And they're carried uh, and then they're carrying, they, they also sort of like carry around standards which are called panja, so five spikes or, or, or a hand, possibly, possibly representing the family of the, the prophet, and the playing of tasa and dole drums, uh, and occasionally the matam, which is the practice of uh, chess, chess beating or self regulation. Right? Uh, and that's the, generally a kind of like trope that you associate with the Muharram sort of celebration. And here we have an example of a Madras scroll painting from 1840s that captures the atmosphere of the put procession in South India, uh, known as, as the Tazia there, right? Comparing to it with Tamil Nadu, is, uh, I think it's productive because it shows us that the Tazia Tabut construction that is quite unique to this cultural sphere, as you can see from this sort of like uh, painting here, I, uh, from the photograph and in comparison to a sort of company painting that comes from, uh, I can never pronounce that name, Tiruchirapuli, Bali, uh, 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 which is very different from the northern Indian and Deccan forms of the Tazia. But perhaps Bengkulu wasn't the first port of call for the Tazia spread and its subsequent manifestation as the Tabor. Something that I've been working on, which I only have tentative answer, is that the hire of the sepoys by the Achini sultans began as early as mid-18th century, principally because uh, the, uh, the sultans had a very difficult relationship with all his ministers, uh, who are the Uli Balangs, and therefore required his own sort of like bodyguard. And this was accounted by the English navigator, Captain Thomas Forrest, uh, and which might then help us to date the origin story of the taboo to a much earlier period, but more importantly, it repositions Aceh and not Bengkulu as a port of entry for the Tabun into sort of Southeast Asia. But that is another story. The main thing, however, is subsequent waves of migration also brought in, uh, brought in also at least a visual awareness of the Indo-Saracenic sort of like dome roof structure, which can be seen in this Tengku Tengok painting. And then there is the question of what the Burak is wearing, a claw? Is that a clock? Uh, why is he, she, or in today's parlance, they keeping time? <laughs> the answer can be possibly found in the building of the Baituraman Great Mosque by the Dutch. Upon the successful conquest of the Aceh, uh, upon the successful conquest of the Achenese capital and their first expedition, the older tier roof mosque was raised to the ground during the battle. In its place now stands a new mosque built in the Indo-Saracenic style. I draw your attention to the presence of a clock now, recessed into the pediment that is now used to keep time and, and, and announce, uh, uh, keep time and keep, keep the prayer times, right? And in this new time, Dutch forces not only conquered territories, this photograph also shows the occupation of the Gungnongan, which is like a, a pleasure, pleasure garden, but uh, that historically had sort of like tantric origin and was used as a sort of seat of judgment. Occupying this seat of judgment is also sort of like uh, symbolically uh, repositioned the Dutch as, uh, uh, as the judge, right? Uh, as the judge uh, who is now able to sort of arbitrate and control uh, and appoint ministers over this land. This conquest, 
uh, survives as a board game at that time. And in the process, the rule over Aceh was distributed amongst loyal Ulibalangs, provincial ministers who were thought to be friendly to sort of Dutch interests. Uh, while the king was, of course, uh, the position of the, uh, the sultan was, of course, uh, abolished. But the Uli Balangs were not always the easiest bunch to subdue. Even the sultan knew better, as I've hinted before. The work of historian Raisa Kamila would track their political organization from the 1920s onward. Here, however, I'm interested in the cultural residue that takes on a new kind of afterlife. This painting of the Burak offers an argument in that direction. Observe the sloped roof howdah, or the sort of like structure on the back of the Burak. I like to think that it is in this structure that we might find something of the banners of the Sword of Ali, as a clarion call to wage a continuing sort of jihad. And that this jihad draws on a visual vocabulary uh, uh, to re-establish the tiered roof cosmos in the region. And this can be seen in continuing attempts to build mosques in the traditional structure as captured by this plan. And what I like about this plan is that it ends also with this really, this plea, right? If, if God willing, kalau ada izin Allah, akan bikin, it will be raised. So there's almost as if uh, there is this, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's this need to uh, want to affirm that a tradition can continue to sort of like exist within modern time. And this can be seen in continuing attempts to build the mosque in the traditional structure captured in the plan, but it also migrates to where? To surrounding region, as can be seen in this photo of Penang Island, where during the Queen Victoria Diamond Jubilee celebration, it registers a presence as a processional vehicle in the tabut, uh, in, 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 uh, as a procession in, in the tabut. Uh, observers have tended to use the phrase Shia influence to describe the cultural practices connected to the latent devotion of Prophet Muhammad in the Malay world. But rather than rely on a term that have gained entrenched sectarian quality, perhaps it is more useful to understand this through Marshall Hawkinson's rather old concept of alit peyti. For Hodgson, uh, such, such devotion of Ali and his descendant is non-denominational, uh, non pointing instead to a shared visual and textual vocabulary of piety for the Prophet's family. Under duress, the martyrdom of Hussein is renewed and gained new moral clarity as a signifier of the injustices of colonialism, and they survive in the pantomime art across the world, from Mauritius, to Natal, South Africa, from Trinidad and Tobago, all the way to sort of like Singapore, right? Uh, oh, sorry, is this this? And then all the way to sort of like Singapore. Finally, um, I guess to think about the sort of like tabut uh, as it finds its way to Singapore, I want to sort of like end by not sort of like perhaps ending with a sort of like grand statement, but showing you a vision of how uh, uh, this sort of like search for a language uh, to clarify the injustice of, sort of colonialism can gain currency and urgency at this particular point in time. And I want to show you this through a, the, uh, possibly the only surviving video um, that I have come across of a tabut celebration in Southeast Asia. Typically, uh, it's, it dates to uh, 1908, and typically, and in the um, uh, in the curatorial annotation uh, that you find on the website uh, of the National Archive of Singapore, it calls it a Chinese uh, uh, Chinese New Year festival celebration. Uh, you will know why she thinks that's the he or she thinks that's the case. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I can sort of like sympathize with that kind of reading, but uh, also like we got to realize that most of the people in the region are not Chinese. Lah. <laughs> so uh, and uh, you can read the codes, right? <laughs> uh, so it, uh, it, uh, unfortunately, it's uh, what book ends the uh, film archive is that what book ends this documentary. Uh, uh, you know, it opens with this sort of like drumming scene and then this is clearly sort of like a, a written over sort of like shot of, you know, the uh, street scene and then you see the harbour scene and uh, it pans across uh, what is uh, the Singapore River. It's, uh, yeah, it used to be dirty. It's not as clean as it is today. 
check that out. Um, but uh, sorry, this is a, a bit long. And, and once it sort of finishes panning, it cuts towards the... Come on. There you go, okay. So it cuts towards the procession. And there you see your puppets <laughs> being processed down the street. But also your lion dance, which is going to come up soon. There. That's why it's Chinese New Year, Chinese New Year Festival. Uh, but what this procession will show you is that uh, along with the procession is, of course, the tabut, but also ships, right? You have the galleon, and then you have the steamship. And later on in the 1930s, what you would find are also battalions, sort of like warships, are being sort of like processed down in other photographs that have sort of survived. Thank you. <laughs>